I'm delighted to uh, just very briefly open the uh, um, session today, which is the uh, launch of the uh, uh, series of uh, events that uh, mark the Global Maritime uh, Accord Academy. Uh, the focus of the session today is uh, primarily um, on the Maritime Ac uh, Accord itself and on its uh, topics, its focus on the uh, health of the ocean and the importance of the ocean health for global um, uh, health, for climate and for sustenance, for equity and for a safe future. Um, could be uh, uh, no one better to talk about a Global Maritime Academy than uh, Admiral Down, uh, a highly decorated uh, uh, mainstay of the Indian Navy, uh, the chief of the Indian Navy, the 22nd um, 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 chair. And we have him talk about the Global Maritime Academy, uh, something that he has developed uh, together with the uh, uh, Society for Aeronautics, Maritime and Defense Studies. And um, I will... Uh, just briefly explain that today's session is also the launch of the Global Maritime Accord Academy, a series of 16 events that will commence today and will um, kind of form a series of talks about different topics from um, ocean bed mining to uh, 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 maritime spatial planning, uh, all in the focus of raising the issues of the fragility of the ocean health, ways of uh, uh, dealing with it, but also implementing change. So the implementation focus will be on this first series of the academy and after that we'll uh, begin to uh, roam other parts of the great important scope. We have all four speakers uh, in front of us here. We have uh, Dr. Dia Berhabib who will talk about illegal fishing and the enforcement of measures against uh, this uh, scourge of the ocean. We have Vice Admiral Ben Beckering, who will uh, who will close the uh, close the event and, and session um, by talking about the International Military Council on Climate and Security and its uh, priorities, its focus, and its analogy to uh, some experiences had with piracy, fighting piracy. Now, uh, Admiral, um, do you mind uh, um, kicking the session off uh, as the twenty second Chief of Naval Staff at the Indian Navy? You're well accustomed after forty two years of of uh, of a career to steer this ship uh, uh, from the shore into the into the into the into the ocean and help us understand what a global maritime academy is all about and why it's so important and how you assembled the group of people that constituted so go ahead and uh, your slides will be shared as you speak thank you very much peter for those kind words of introduction at the very outset, I would like to accord a very warm welcome to our teams from the Liechtenstein Institute of Strategic Development, the Society for Aerospace, Maritime and Defense Studies, India, the International Military Council on Climate and Security, Netherlands, the Trebuchet USA, Sai University in India, and also we have the Frankfurting Film in Germany. We also would like to welcome all our maritime experts, the environmental specialists, and the researchers who have joined in from different parts of the world across various time zones to be here for the launch of the Global Maritime Accord Academy. As you're all aware, the Global Maritime Accord is an ambitious uh, initiative to conjoin the forces of all stakeholders in an organized manner for the protection, conservation, as well as sustainable development of the oceans, particularly the areas beyond national jurisdiction. And the aim is to draw up an action plan to counter the detrimental impacts of global warming and climate change by leveraging the oceans. The Global Maritime Accord Academy, which we launched today, is intended as a platform for teaching, learning, research, and exchange of ideas. And as Dr. Peter said, uh, it is intended to have about 16 webinars, and these will be uh, conducted by maritime experts, by environment specialists, 
as well as researchers from across the world. I'm sure that the very enriching presentations and the vibrant deliberations will throw up some path-breaking recommendations to draft the Global Maritime Accord. Our blue planet, the Earth, has a dominance of the maritime domain with over 70% of the Earth's surface covered by water, nearly 80% of the world's population living within 200 nautical miles of the coast, and 90% of the world's trade transiting by sea. Oceans are essential to life on Earth. They are rich in oil, gas, and mineral resources. They are the suppliers of oxygen and provide for nearly 50% of the world's oxygen needs. They are the absorbers of carbon dioxide and quietly absorb more than 30% of greenhouse gases. They are rich in biodiversity. And at the same time, we also see that they supply humanity with food, fish, as well as the medicine requirements and work as a virtual heat sink, which keeps our planet Earth cool. With depletion of resources on land, humankind has turned towards the seas for resources. And there is a misperception that the oceans are an unending resource base and an infinite sink. Nothing could be further away from reality. The reality is that over the past few decades, we have witnessed indiscriminate pollution of the oceans and contamination of the natural marine habitat, resulting in a detrimental impact of global warming and climate change on the oceans. Studies have indicated that nearly 80% of all pollution in the oceans emanate from land. And if the current rate of pollution continues, in a few decades from now, we will have more plastic in the ocean than fish. About 13 million tons of plastic and garbage is dumped into the global oceans every year. This is one of the reasons that we have gone in to a great initiative to draft the Global Maritime Accord, which has clean and healthy oceans as its core theme to ensure sustainable development of the oceans with the overall vision for a safe oceans as to save our world. The core issue is that nearly 65% of the oceans and 95% of the earth habitat comprise the areas beyond national jurisdiction. However, no governance or administration exists in the areas beyond national jurisdiction and the oceans are extremely vulnerable to mankind's want and greed resulting in global warming, climate change, sea level rise, depletion of natural marine habitat, and also toxic food chains, including microplastics in salt and fish from the oceans. The core of the issue is that so far we have the concept of the freedom of the seas, which is the finders keepers approach and has resulted in overfishing and depletion of the fish stocks. The second concept is the concept of common heritage of mankind, which is adopted for deep seabed mining and is a shared and cost benefit approach. The nations address the oceans from their maritime interests. And the problem is that the main stakeholder, the oceans have no representation in discussion on the ocean health, ocean resources, and ocean utilization. The Global Maritime Accord is intended as the ocean's petition to mankind, and the GMA will also be the council for the ocean's call on save the oceans for a safe earth. The next slide indicates to you that nearly all the sustainable development goals are linked to the oceans. There is therefore a need to have a global maritime accord because disruption of delicate maritime ecology of the oceans is hazardous to our collective future. Oceans impact all nations as they control climate change. Safety, security, stability, and sustainability of our oceans 
cannot be left only to goodness of humankind and the good sense of nations or lack of it. Recently in March this year, we had an international agreement on conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. However, an action plan for implementation of this agreement is yet to be drafted. This makes the Global Maritime Accord a relevant and a timely initiative as the ocean's petition to mankind and a solemn and sacred settlement between oceans and mankind towards mitigating the risks of global warming. The signatories are the Oceans Council and mankind's conscious with the common vision, as I said, to save oceans for a safe earth. There are 16 basic principles for the GMA, which include tackling of climate change, reduction in marine pollution, harnessing the blue economy, strengthening guidance of technological innovation, reinforcement of capacity building to take collective actions and to promote legislative governance. Some of the social benefits of the Global Maritime Accord include protection and regeneration of coastal livelihood, reduction in ocean-derived natural disasters, to prevent coastal and offshore ocean slums, to develop partnerships for information awareness, reduce hazards to health from ocean-based pollutants, and improve nutrition through sustainable fishing. Some of the economic benefits of the Global Maritime Accord would include promoting equitable and sustainable business operations, to monetize ocean spaces through marine spatial planning, which is a very, very important aspect to prevent development of ocean slums, to create offshore infrastructure for renewable sources of ocean energy, to optimize ocean routing and trade, and to spur investments into space, artificial intelligence, and genetic technology. The environmental benefits of the Global Maritime Accord include control of greenhouse emissions to arrest global warming, reduce sea level rise, which is critical for low-lying island nations, to reinvigorate the ocean ecosystem through geofence, no shipping zones, no fishing zones, and to demarcate the marine protected areas. The ongoing international efforts include the Global Diversity Conference during 2022, when it was decided that effective conservation and management of at least 30% of the world's lands, inland waters, coastal areas, and oceans would be ensured. It is important, however, to remember that currently less than 10% of the world's marine areas are under protection. And this is indicated in the next slide where the map shows the current status of the marine protected areas. You can see the vast swaths of the oceans and only the blue dots in that are the marine protected areas which comprise just about 10%. We next move on to the research methodology which we have formed under five thematic research areas. The problem space statement for the first one is how should maritime resources and assets in the areas beyond national jurisdiction be cataloged? And the approach is by mapping and monitoring of the ABNJs to have mapping of the natural marine habitats, mapping of known seabed mineral resources. And this is where we need to be mindful of the danger of natural marine habitat by deep seabed mining, and we would need to cap these at some stage. Mapping of the renewable energy resources and the framework for maritime resource benefit sharing as a public good, which is indeed a very, very important activity. The thematic research area number two actually looks at the problem area of what are the best global practices for the environmental impact assessments and the strategic environment assessments. And here the solution is to have standard processes for the environment impact assessment and to carry out capacity studies for the strategic environment assessment, monitoring and measuring of pollution at sea. And here I'd like to mention that we would need to go beyond monitoring and actually have an action plan for cleanup of the oceans. 
I had mentioned that we are dumping in about 13 million tons of garbage and plastic. And over the decades, this has formed into large floating islands in every ocean of the world. These large garbage floating islands or gyres in the North Pacific is of the size of 1.6 million square kilometers, which is three times the land area of France. And the gyre in the Indian Ocean has an area of 5 million square kilometers, which is one and a half times the land size of India. It is therefore important that we look at cleanup of the oceans as part of our action plan. We look at disposal of nuclear and plastic and other waste and the criteria for sustainable ABNJs in recognition of environment and economic consideration. In thematic research area three, the problem we look at is how the GMA can be integrated into existing maritime regimes and architectures. And the solution is by networking maritime security and harnessing of the blue economy to examine the legal regimes at sea, to see the role of cooperation between maritime forces for surveillance and response, and to explore synergies with existing maritime security architectures. The fourth thematic research area looks at the problem of tenants for marine spatial planning, which, as I said, is one of the most important prerequisites for the Global Maritime Accord. And here we would need to find the designation of the marine protected areas for sustained protection and conservation. We look at no fishing zones, we look at green shipping corridors, and we limit and cap the seabed exploration and mining, which I had mentioned earlier. And we look at the exclusion zones and peace sanctuaries in the Arctic and Antarctic areas beyond national jurisdiction. For the final thematic research area, we look at the suitable overarching structure for operationalizing of the GMA, and we examine the creation of global maritime administration governance and information collection system or MAGICS, the international cooperation for an effective maritime domain awareness, creation of an international maritime automated routing and reporting system, options for a low cost international ocean constabulary because effective response is a prerequisite for all the monitoring that's done. We need to have web-based information sharing, funding for the administration of GMA, and finally, the capacity building for small island development states because these states do not have the wherewithal to carry out their own surveillance as well as policing. The GMA work plan includes conduct of research on the identified thematic areas, review of the research reports by mentors, summarize findings and action points into a comprehensive global maritime accord, develop an action plan for implementing the global maritime accord, and finally, to bequeath the global maritime accord to humankind on 8th of June, 2025, which is World Oceans Day. And as you can see, that is indeed a very, very ambitious task. The research would be carried out in five thematic areas, as mentioned, by about 50 researchers across gender, geopolitics, and geographies. We have international conferences, regional seminars, papers to be presented, webinars, crowdsourced ideas, with oversight by mentors and domain experts, and the program would be managed by the Society for Aerospace, Maritime and Defense Studies in partnership with LISD and our other partners such as IMCCS and SCI University. The key takeaways are, as the world is increasingly challenged by impact of climate change and global warming, much of its solutions are to be found in our oceans. I mentioned that 50% of the oxygen needs are provided by the oceans. Therefore, every second breath we take, we owe it to our oceans. And this is the same oceans that provide carbon storage, oxygen generation, transportation, energy, food and salt, and its critical role in climate regulation. However, these services and products are under increasing threats due to over-exploitation of ocean resources, increasing marine pollution, 
as well as development of ocean slums. We have a transformational framework for governance of the global commons, which has recently been agreed, but an implementation plan is yet to be conceived and charted. This is where the Global Maritime Accord can become the base framework, framework document for international community to adopt as its primary mechanism for safe, secure, stable, and sustainable oceans. In conclusion, the Global Maritime Accord is a novel and timely initiative towards mitigating the risks of global warming and climate change by judicious exploitation of oceanic resources. The project envisages collaboration of international mentors, researchers, and industry participants to prepare a Global Maritime Accord and an action plan. The Global Maritime Accord is the ocean's petitions to mankind and the GMA Academy is the Council for the Ocean and the Keeper of Conscious of Mankind. I would like all of you to reflect on this quote that if we are not to perish as nations, we need to unite as mankind and understand the message that the waves bring daily to our shores. And the message is loud and clear, save oceans for a safe earth. Finally, I would like to thank the entire GMA team on behalf of the Society for Aerospace, Maritime and Defense Studies. This is part of the team that you see on the screen. This is the GMA team across the world. I would also like to thank each and every one of you who have joined in uh, for the launch of the Global Maritime Academy. And I would like to invite you to be a part of this dynamic initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Admiral, uh, for this uh, really detailed and comprehensive view. And uh, it reminds me that we will also issue a inaugural um, publication on the uh, four presentations given today and on the GMA uh, within a short time after we complete this session today and this inaugural opening. I uh, wanted to just really base my presentation on um, on uh, what you have uh, just uh, described as uh, so super critical um, in terms of uh, oceans and climatic context. So we'll be focusing on uh, that elaboration, but also I'd like to highlight uh, the oceans as a global commons and uh, remind ourselves that this uh, ancient habitat uh, for so many um, um, aquatic species uh, has been also a, a point of discovery for humankind has become seagoing and the uh, uh, from the uh, ancient uh, seagoing nations uh, the Phoenicians the Greeks the Roman the Indians but also the Chinese um, the Arabs uh, and uh, on to the Portuguese and the Spanish began to discover the oceans in their you know a naivete their their discovery their adventurers uh, uh, a drive to conquer these unknown worlds and you see Ferdinand Magellan pointing into the straits named after him and uh, not showing not sure whether going in the right direction but he he started something which uh, stuck with us for a number of centuries and that's the notion of the Mare Clausum the closed oceans the oceans that were locked and occupied by certain colonial nations and uh, and of course, uh, that couldn't really last uh, very long, but it lasted for 150 years until um, the Dutch East India Company seized the Portuguese vessel and uh, a court case ensued. And uh, this, young, um, um, this young lawyer uh, uh, came up with a treatise arguing not to defend the seizing of the, Portu of the, of the Portuguese vessel, but uh, arguing for the free oceans. For the Mare Liberum, which is still the beginning of the notion of the commons, the global commons that uh, today in the international law are constituted by not just the high seas, but also the atmosphere, Antarctica, and space, mostly orbit, orbital space. But you could also see, of course, they're seen as public goods, as something to exploit, to have, to grab, and because it doesn't belong to anyone else. Um, but uh, we are together, I think the GM really strive for a different interpretation of global commons as the natural law, the biosphere, climate, and something I call excess, the existential stuff 
um, that uh, is required to uh, propel us forward into a uh, sustainable future. And so when we look at our um, our planet here, this composed uh, modus image of 2002 of uh, hundreds of thousands of detailed uh, images collected over a four uh, month period, you have to sort of um, be full of confidence that uh, this um, species that cares so much about the earth will care for the earth but an alien who would might come fly by this planet and says well show me your orbit and i tell you who you are and if you look at our orbit you see who we are we tend to dump things into our commons and we tend to care of course about that dumping process it, it teaches us so much about it these are the uh, satellites uh, and, and and pieces of space junk that existed uh, uh, 15 years ago, and of course it has uh, um, uh, gathered uh, a pace, and uh, so uh, the clear view of the global commons of the sky is now obstructed, uh, not just by Starlink satellites, yeah, obstructing the twin star Bureau in Cygnus, but also um, uh, uh, many other satellite configurations. And that really, uh, I think it, it's sort of a turning point in our understanding of the importance of protecting global commons one of them being, of course, the cloud cryospheres or Antarctica and the MODIS image mapped very cautiously and carefully, it quickly uh, claimed by a number of nations. Uh, and uh, we have now a situation where we actually um, have a halting of that claim and, uh, and as head scratching of what to do, how to cooperate and to work. But meanwhile, of course, the, uh, the heating of the Antarctic um, uh, continent has progressed. This is a image or a mapping of the top millimeter of uh, what is called ter uh, terrestrial skin of ice and water and a two degree increase that occurred in so many areas in, in a 30 year period. And so the acceleration of the, uh, of the ice shelves that are mapped here in this uh, NASA um, uh, interpretation of this relative speed of the ice flows has in a paper discovered been discovered this year as uh, beginning to actually uh, block and uh, swamp um, the uh, benthic or deep ocean um, uh, currents around Antarctica and creating heat waves, uh, something that's been matched in the North Atlantic uh, meridional overturning circulation by swamping of the northern end of that. And of course, that's highly troubling because it could uh, mean a stalling of the uh, of the of the connected uh, various uh, flows that. Uh, drive nutrients and oxygen through the oceans. So the hydrosphere that results of that, the understanding of the oceans has been the core, the receptacle, the end and the, and the center of the hydrosphere is, uh, uh, is the focus of the, of the GMA in a way uh, that the oceans uh, are occupied by microorganisms or very small animals which form the bottom of the food chain or part of the bottom of the food chain. Uh, and uh, I'd like to just celebrate here the copepods, pods, uh, which uh, uh, millimeter sized uh, microbes, microbial sized um, crustaceans, uh, which uh, weigh together five gigatons, uh, more than all an land animals combined. Uh, and they're moving 30 times more carbon than is being emitted by mankind. Every night they're moving 20, 200 meters up and down, uh, nibbling on the phytoplankton and discharging carbon below. This is a massive carbon pump uh, that uh, nobody is uh, really talking about and the phytoplankton they're nibbling on, just like the copy pots, declining by 40 to 50 uh, percent over the last 70 is very troubling because the phytoplankton, of course, is not just uh, critical in absorbing CO2, but also the generation of, 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 um, of oxygen and, uh, and, uh, and forming the base of uh, the, um, uh, the, the the aquatic food chain. And one of the reasons we really focused on today's topic that Dr. Abel Habib will talk about, the uh, uh, illegal fishing is the protection of the marine the biodiversity, not just as a nice thing uh, in an aquarium, but as the core of, of the climate threat. Without the biology in the oceans, we wouldn't have any ability to manage carbon. So the 90% of ocean fish stock that's pushed to the brink is the carbon engine in it. And the protected areas uh, need to be expanded and there's uh, a ridiculously small amount of oceans and uh, ABNJs that are committed to uh, no-take areas. Uh, that's one of our core uh, aims to expand that. Of course, uh, we tend to collect the seafood and throw it away. Half of US seafood is uh, wasted and uh, 
There's enormous amount of bycatch, six times the bycatch of prawn collecting. Millions of sh uh, animals, sea animals, are being struck each year. It's a massacre occurring. Um, and we need to stop that. And we will talk about ways of using uh, marine spatial planning and other kind of satellite-based uh, means of, of warning uh, ships and uh, getting their concurrence to alter their course. But of course, this doesn't really work yet and uh, will some time will be needed to make it work on the uh, high seas and the areas beyond national jurisdiction. And certainly for smaller animals who make up the grow of the damage. Marine shipping is a major cause of damage, and here we have uh, an important part of the global economy, the 30 trillion US dollars today, um, but also a major source of global um, greenhouse gas emissions, but also a major source of ocean pollution. You see the oil slick being dragged by this uh, vessel in, uh, that's been dumping its uh, bilge water. Um, that's being mapped here by the Sky Truth Satellite uh, uh, Service, um, which is analogous in a way to the oil slick that beach bathers leave, the uh, suntan lotions and also the uh, protective uh, chemicals we put on our skins are not just um, uh, protecting us, but extremely damaging to the waters and uh, to corals and, and sea animals, highly toxic substances that should be underestimated. Um, then add the ballast water discharge, the uh, routine taking up of, of ballast water, of uh, transferring uh, organisms from one part of the world to another, but also the chlorine and other chemical that are often used, not always, but often used to, to, to combat that uh, contamination. And then we have our you know, cruise liners who are in the coastal waters restricted to polluting the atmosphere, but out in the open ocean also dump the sewage. Uh, because that's allowed there. It's a, it's a free for all. Of course, there are other kinds of cruise liners who are not, um, but even worse in uh, in terms of their pollution uh, output. Um, and so this all ends up in the deep, in the water, in the uh, uh, shallows, but also the very uh, depth of the abyssal plain and the hadal so on. But I would like to just really focus on the interface of that ocean with the atmosphere because that interface is probably the most important part of the oceans for the climate management and that has to do with the sea surface micro layer which is only a millimeter thick layer of uh, of, of of organic material and living organisms uh, existing in that micro layer and that that air water interface is responsible in a way for the formation of clouds for the spawning of aerosols for controlling water vapor by the way Water vapor is the most powerful greenhouse gas. And so the thermal transfer buffer that this uh, layer uh, um, represents is very important in, 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 this, in the slowing down of the oceanic temperature uptake and not heating up too quickly. And also the chemical exchange type buffer, very important, slowing down CO2 uptake. But that um, layer is in danger. There's this uh, massive pollution through black carbon. This is all uh, mostly from ships, but also from burning wood in uh, adjacent uh, lands, but also microplastic fibers, all acting to uh, damage that, uh, that layer and uh, increasing the ability of the oceans to take up um, CO2, turning it into a carbonic acid, uh, which then in turn turns into carbonate iron and bicarbonate irons and releasing hydrogen irons, which is the um the, the nature of uh, uh the very nature of of, of acid so this study um uh, by the ghost foundation uh, argues uh, that if we're not immediately acting we could have a situation about 2045 we have a point of no return where the oceans become so acidic that, that crustaceans will not survive and uh, marine mammals will collapse and that means uh, that this trajectory, which has been established for the last 50 years, there's a 50% decline in ocean um, uh, life over the last 50 years, um, will continue if this is not caught in the uh, attempts to stop uh, emissions and to uh, stop pollution. Because it, the study is arguing that if we didn't have pollution, we wouldn't have climate change. We would be able to manage much of the uh, carbon pollution. I would argue with that, but. Uh, the, the, the situation is more than more than dire because that's a trajectory which is not being caught right now. So there are four means 
of eliminating plastic pollution. The coastal waste runoff is critical. Fossil fuels and wood burning. Uh, it doesn't sound like an ocean issue, but it is in fact impacting deeply on the ocean. And the so-called lipophilic forever chemicals, those poly, uh, polyfluoric alkyl substances uh, are, are highly, highly, highly damaging. So there's a lot of agendas coming together, but one agenda which is not terribly uh, helpful at the moment is to try to uh, help the oceans through uh, uh, um, climate engineering, increasing the ocean's ability to increase carbon while not reducing emissions. So I will just skip over that. I think alkalinity may have to be uh, looked at, but I think this point is that what we have to focus on. This is the stuff we have to get out of our waters. And uh, this is the stuff we also have to get the anthroposphere away from, which is now stuck like a uh, heroin addict on uh, a juice which makes possible this kind of urban vision, which is all coal and natural gas. And these 80% of our energy demands have not really changed much in the last 20 years. 95% of global transport energy is petroleum based. We have a massive uh, water damage through these uh, industries that create this, um, this, uh, this, this supply chain. And an enormous uh, fossil fuel pollution that's global, that is not distinguishing between Europe, India, China, or, or other parts of the world. And we've got a military threat is uh, in 50% in of the military outlays are, are spent on securing the oil supplies that are needed to run the military. So there's a sort of a bit of a focus that has to happen. And yeah, I will like to uh, remind you that from 1750 to 1950, this increase of emissions have been very dramatic. But as soon as I was born, bang, this is what happened. And uh, it's not my fault, but this is extraordinary to just remind ourselves how dramatic that increases, which is scary, but it's also hopeful because if it can rise as quickly, maybe can fall as quickly and we can work together to make that fall and make it just a very short spike in, uh, in the history of the earth and a spike, hopefully the climate will not, um, will not notice, but it has noticed it and it has noticed it way below 1.5 degrees. Uh, the Arctic began to melt at 0.6 degrees. We've got a problem with the polar vortex that's been destabilized, cut in half, tumbling around and having uh, destabilized the stratospheric winds, the jet stream, causing global heat waves and uh, global um, accelerated forest burning, which have been, of course, uh, helped uh, by our um, uh, craving for um, uh, beef and uh, soy uh, beans and, and so forth. Uh, but you see this um, emission of carbon monoxide from the uh, Amazon rainforest, but also from the African forest and from the boreal forest to the north in 2019. That should give us a rise to uh, uh, to waking up and to realizing that this uh, 800,000 year long uh, concentrations of um, of CO2 are 280 parts per million this year at uh, beyond 400 parts per million is not sustainable and what if you look at methane it's been 600 parts per billion for that time frame and guess what it's uh, been uh, last year 1900 three times the sustainable level so that has to really come down because what it has created is a shifting of the level of this piloting of planet earth the uh, energy imbalance is such that it has doubled doubled the energy content of the atmosphere in 15 years. And if that continues, these 13.7 degrees from 1869 to 2023 to 15 degrees, well, we can only uh, project to nine times forward. Um, if you have nine times the doubling, what would you have? Well, today you would have 65 degrees if we didn't have oceans at all. That's interesting, isn't it? Didn't have oceans, we'd have 65 degrees of the earth. But we would have 250 degrees by 2158, if we allow the temperature to double nine times. And by the way, Carl Sagan and uh, Stephen Hawking both thought this would be the worst case. So we don't want that worst case. Got to be down to 280 parts per million in the atmosphere means that we have to act now and we have to reduce more than we emit. That is the real challenge. We have to reduce, uh, absorb more CO2 than we admit. We have got to have 100% renewable energy in the system. We can do it through nuclear fusion. We have a massive fusion reactor already in the sky. We don't 
uh, need any additional ones that provides more energy than we need. And so the transformation of our city is actually part of the solution of the oceans. And so this transformation of our energy system and our economy is part of the solution for the oceans because it takes the pressure of the CO2 uh, acidification. And it's my own home, uh, home turf. And we did a study we could by 2050, not just CO2 uh, uh, neutral, we would be climate carbon negative by transforming the agricultural land that exists here from industrial to uh, climate landscapes and to turn this entire region of 15,000 square kilometers into a carbon sink. And so um, that's the transformation of this uh, old landscape into new landscapes, into new kinds of economies, into new kinds of visions that are realized here, for instance, in the city of Hamburg over a seven year period into a uh, uh, carbon negative part of the city. Uh, it can be done and it can be done worldwide. Here's a biogas project in India, which is just as important as this tea plantation uh, interspersed with orange trees in Iran, uh, seabed farming in Bali, uh, the mangrove strengthening work in India, very important powerhouse of carbon sequestration, the mangrove forest, existing forests that are retained, but also boglands. Uh, these are the three most important carbon stores we have. And you can translate that into housing estates uh, here from the Netherlands. Uh, you can also begin to move those cars uh, that belching uh, carbon from off the road. And finally, you don't even need vehicles if you adopt the Copenhagen Postal Service, a motto of no engines, they're all human powered. And finally, our cities need to learn to get away from abusing the oceans as a resource for um, overconsumption. And so I'd like to close on this vision of the, uh, the solution of the ocean also lies on land that we have to uh, find a way of protecting the real heart of the climate solution by transforming our own lives on land. And it is happening. And that's the good message at which I would like to end. So thank you. And I would like to uh, not comment on my own speech, but uh, uh, immediately hand over to uh, Dia Berabib, Dr. Habib, who's uh, has made a, uh, um, a, a academic career and a real professional focus on pursuing the crime of uh, illegal fishing. And uh, Dr. Habib, take it away. Thank you very much um, for that. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you're seeing it now. Um, I don't know whose anxiety spiked alongside the temperatures and acidity in the global oceans, but mine definitely did. And I'm definitely not going to lower it down with this because illegal fishing, as the title says, um, is definitely a threat. Another additional threat. It's in fact the second uh, most threatening issue in the world oceans today alongside climate change. I was tasked um, to present this in a way where there is a solution associated with the problem and I needed to talk about some of the issues at hand that we see first. Number one thing is that well, I'm not going to talk about climate change because I feel that that has been tackled quite nicely and um, I personally do not, I'm not an expert on climate change and it makes me feel very scared each time we talk about it. That's just my personal feeling there. Um, the first thing I have to say with regards to illegal fishing is that fish is not given the importance that it should be when we're in policy circles, we're in governance circles, and even national security circles. However, we eat fish on average more than we drink coffee. It is the first most traded food commodity in the world. We just do not realize it as much because we don't we don't understand how many people feed on it or how many people eat it. There are around 3.2 billion people on the planet that need fish for their livelihoods, for their survival, for their food, for their protein. It is the single one most healthy source of animal protein out there. Um, fisheries are also a platform for resilience. So if we look into what's happening around the world in terms of epidemic outbreaks, for example, in Sierra Leone and in Liberia and Guinea, when there was the Ebola epidemic, uh, around the 2014, 2015, what happened was that people tended to go fishing more and more because any other forms of meat were deemed to be a little, or bush meat, if you will, were deemed to be a little too dangerous for them to consume at that point in time. Any storms, when there is a hurricane, when there is um, 
um, any form of storms basically out there, uh, typhoon, people tend to go fishing as well, despite the destruction of fishing boats and fishing gears. And we found this in 2017 when we were looking into the impacts of fisheries, what happens to fisheries after disasters happen. Earthquakes is the same thing. Um, it's also a platform for resilience during wars and civil unrest. So we've seen this in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Congo when people went fishing um, after there was a civil war triggered uh, inland. We've seen this in Liberia as well in Sierra Leone. And if we link this to climate change and climate disasters, every time there is a drought, especially in Africa, every time there is a drought, you expect people to go fishing because agricultural lands are not so productive because of the lack of rain or the death of their crops. Unfortunately, however, there is a problem that accompanies this form of resilience is that one in four fish globally is caught illegally and one in five fish is tainted with slave labor, which is another problem that we're not going to discuss that much today. There are around 4.6 million fishing vessels in the world and fishing or fisheries are increasingly used as a vector of crimes beyond just illegal fishing. And the problem there is that only 2% of these vessels are currently tracked, geographically speaking, and we know the activities of only 2% of these vessels. Before we get into impacts and drivers and solutions, I'd like to go through the definition. We, I was tasked to talk about IUU fishing, and personally, I'm not a big fan of the term IUU because it is part of the problem. The way that we define things is part of the problem in policies and when we define regulations and solutions to basically um, fight those kind of issues. So illegal fishing, so IUU stands for illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. And illegal fishing is a matter of compliance. There is a regulation, there is a law, there is a policy, and operators do not abide by those regulations, laws, or policies. So that's a matter of compliance or lack of compliance thereof. And there are many reasons why people do not abide by regulations, many drivers that we're going to talk about in a second. And regulated fishing is not a matter of compliance, it's a matter of policy and governance. When there is a fishery that is not, that is not regulated, when there are, there are non-existing laws and regulations around that fishery, let's talk about the squid fishery in the Indian Ocean, there are dozens or thousands of other smaller fisheries around the world that are not currently regulated, it is not a matter of compliance. So if an operator goes in and fishes, that is not illegal fishing and it should not be construed as illegal fishing. It's a matter of lack of governance and regulations around that fishery and there are no sanctions to be had at that particular point in time. Unreported fishing is an issue of both resources, regulations and compliance at the same time. But in most considerations, I would say that unreported fishing is the lack of reporting of catches and happens mostly within smaller scale fisheries when they are widespread and it's difficult to monitor them. It is not a lack of compliance oftentimes. All this being said, there is one thing that we need to understand before creating solutions. For climate change, it's pretty, I would say that it's, it's complicated, it's a complicated issue, but the solution is very simple. For illegal fishing, the solution is really convoluted. There is no one single solution. It's not only compliance. It's also tackling the drivers to begin with of illegal fishing. And in terms of drivers, we conducted a study in uh, that was published last year where we looked into the different drivers of illegal fishing. So why do people fish illegally? Why do operators engage in this, I would say, crime, quote unquote? Um, we have looked into the main theory of crime, which says that opportunity drives crime. This was introduced by Folsom in 1995, I believe, or 1994, where the main driver of crime or illegal fishing or any sort of other lack of compliance was deemed to be economic profit. The ability to fish or the ability to fish illegally to get money is the one driver of illegal fishing. And after looking into multiple fisheries and talking to and interviewing people that have been caught red-handed, we understood that there is much more to that than just opportunity or just economic profit. So definitely economic profit is one thing, but there is also the ability to fish illegally because of the lack of enforcement or the lack of intelligence or the lack of assets at sea to be able to see who is fishing illegally. The fact that there is ignorance of the rules here in Canada, for example, in British Columbia, where I, where I am, the rules are so complicated and every single year, if not every single month, there is a new additional rule or license condition. People just cannot keep up. And the reality is not, it's not only about the fact that there are 
too many rules to keep up with. There is also the fact that there is a divide between the rules that we're creating to protect fishing, fish stocks and the environment and the ability of people to understand them. I have seen communities where the literacy levels are so low, and yet they were presented with posters written in French or in English, which is not even their native language, on what the regulations are in a new existing marine protected area that was created basically for forcibly without proper consultations. In that particular instance, we will see people go to fish illegally, not only because they don't know the rules or they do not understand them, but because there is a new regulation that they were not consulted on. And this drives me to the next, um, the next driver, which is a sense of ownership and entitlement, especially within coastal communities and indigenous communities. We're not only talking about the industrial sector when we're talking about illegal fishing. After all, 98% of the global fleet is actually artisanal or small scale in nature. So it's pretty important to tackle that one as well. And criminalizing people is not a way of tackling the issue at hand here. So when we talk about the sense of ownership and entitlement, and we've talked about marine protected areas and the importance of marine protected areas by Admiral Doan uh, earlier this morning, at least my time. Um, there is a way of doing or creating marine protected areas, for example. There is a consultation process that has to be had, at a, that has to be in place at a certain point in time for people to understand their importance, but also for us to understand what could the impact of those marine protected areas be on fish stocks, but also on people, on their livelihood and their willingness to abide by those new rules that are being established. In many cases, when marine protected area are forced down the throats of communities, what happens is that we create a shadow activity where people are still going to go fishing because they feel a sense of injustice, but because also they do not have the choice. They've seen their families fish there for decades, if not for centuries, and they do not necessarily know what else to do at that particular point in time. However, the result of that is that we create a shadow activity, which is basically illegal, and that's also a driver of illegal fishing. There is also illegal fishing as a protest fishery, and I know this does not happen that often, but the reality is that it's real. When there is a problem between fishing communities, fishermen, and governments, the problem might arise where people will want to go fishing just because they need to protest rules that are in place that do not work. This is different from the sense of ownership and entitlement. We've seen this in the cod fishery here in Canada, in the lobster fishery in Canada. We've seen this as well here in the herring fishery as well. We've seen this in New Zealand and in the United States and mainly in the G20 countries where there is a sense of um, you know, I can do this. I'm going to do this. It's not going to become, and it's very painful for me to say this, but I've seen similar protests happening in Senegal where the protest became very violent. People went out to fish to protest certain new regulations and what and, and failing development projects. And what happened was that that became pretty violent pretty soon. I have seen things here in Canada where people chained themselves into government buildings while going out to fish, while others went out to fish because they needed to protest new regulations as well. Mine, it might work and, or it might not work, but the reality is that it drives another form of illegal fishing as well. There is also necessity. We cannot expect people to stop fishing just because there are rules in place. When people need fish as food, as a source of food or as a source of money for their livelihoods, when there are low or no other alternative forms of livelihoods for them to engage in, legal alternative forms of livelihoods for them to engage in, there is going to, uh, to be a tendency to engage in either illegal fishing or other types of crimes. And this brings in the circular form where illegal fishing and climate change generate environmental degradation. We see less, less fish in the waters. We see, for example, as a result of climate change in tropical areas, fish tends to go north. So people within those tropical areas lose opportunities to fish. But also the same thing happens when there is too much fishing or overfishing or illegal fishing. You lose opportunities to fish. And if fishing is your only livelihood, you are going to basically go use illegal gear, for example, dynamites or fish within closed areas, fish during closed seasons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The reality is that illegal fishing is not a crime on its own. It's not an offense on its own. It often drive, uh, drives other forms of offenses. If it's not illegal fishing, it's going to be something else that might be much worse in terms of national security and in terms of uh, impacts on people's lives and health. So if we see this graph here, and I know it looks very complicated, 
but this shows you the complexity is the message on its own how illegal fishing is really something that is embedded in transnational criminality so we're no longer looking only into illegal fishing if we do not solve this problem there are other types of problems that are going to arise so we're looking into for example you look into the industrial sector you see the the how the flow goes all along into other types of crimes so for example we see smuggling that is associated with illegal fishing that is associated with human rights and labor abuse with transshipment issues and so on fraud money laundering and so on and so forth on the artisanal sector the more illegal fishing there is the more illegal fishing there will be because the reality is that people are going to want to use alternative ways to keep fishing because there is oftentimes the only thing that they can do to survive and if it's not illegal fishing we've also seen a conversion into other forms of crime such as drug trafficking or drug muling to be able to gain some um some alternative forms of, of livelihoods and, and survive at the end of the day and the reality is that if we do not tackle the issue of illegal fishing and it's becoming quite urgent right now because as was mentioned earlier fish stocks are not necessarily doing great only uh, i would say 90 percent are either fully exploited or have been over exploited already which means that we're already at the edge we cannot afford to go any further and illegal fishing is the number one threat in terms of fish stocks but also in terms of you know health and national security and other types of impact so if we're looking into impacts we're no longer talking only about fish we know that fish is being already threatened by climate change illegal fishing and overfishing is another threat but when you combine these three together so there's the resilience of fish stocks to be able to renew themselves or to be able to rebuild is really lowered down and that's a problem because if illegal fishing came on its own with a little bit of time fish stocks can rebuild and we've seen this for so long we've seen fish stocks that have been rebuilding and there are a lot of them that are rebuilding right now but the problem is that when you combine that with over exploitation when you combine that with climate change the resilience of fish stocks to be able to rebuild is really threatened as well the loss of livelihood is also a major um, ironically major impact of illegal fishing because on one hand livelihoods are maintained by illegal fishing when environmental degradation occurs so here we lose fishing opportunities we lose money and we basically drive when I say we, I'm talking about illegal fishing, obviously, we basically drive more poverty into societal lives. The loss of life is another impact of illegal fishing. Currently, the official statistic is 120,000 people dying every year um, in the fishing sector. Fishing is deemed the one most dangerous um, job out there in many countries around the world, including here in Canada and many countries across West Africa and Southeast Asia. The reality is that when you have two forms of illegal fishing that could happen that would threaten people's lives you have incursions into artisanal areas or artisan that are frequent or areas that are frequented by heavily frequented by artisanal or small scale operators where you have collisions that are happening quite often and you have on the other hand people or artisanal operators or small scale operators venturing further and further to catch fish because their waters are over exploited or they are losing opportunities to fish so they have to spend more money more fuel and unfortunately have more risks incurred during their operations to go further to fish and a lot of people get lost at sea because of that and lose their lives there's also food insecurity which comes along head uh, alongside the loss of livelihood as well there is less fish to catch there is less money there is less food staples and there is less protein to eat rising national security threats we have seen in the case of somalia for example at the very beginning it's no longer the case today but at the very beginning the frustration drawn by illegal waste dumping and by uh, illegal fishing operations were the number one reason why this form of insurgency that became later piracy was generated and we're seeing that in the gulf of guinea as well in general environmental degradation whether we're talking about illegal fishing or other forms of environmental degradation including climate change impact will result in increasing uh, risks or threats to national security from the maritime sector we're seeing more and more insurgency at sea we're seeing more and more protests rising we're seeing you know when you have social unrest because of economic issues uh, issues loss of job we are going to see more societal rest uh, unrest that will lead into national security threats and in fact the united Na the united states coast guard deemed illegal fishing as a national security threat um increasing maritime crimes and this is when I talked about transversality illegal fishing drives increased crimes any form of environmental degradation where people's livelihoods are being affected 
will result likely in increased crimes as well because people who do not have the choice will tend to commit illegal infractions, offenses, or often crimes. We're seeing this in Latin and South America where we're, there is an increasing shift towards drug trafficking from the maritime sector. Boats are mostly or increasingly used in the maritime sector, especially small-scale boats, as ways to transit or to traffic drugs into the United States. There is also the decline of economic resilience that we talked about uh, earlier. So when you have lower livelihoods, people, I've, I've, I was in Togo recently in the, I believe it was in February, where we were talking to people in communities who lost their livelihoods, who lost their ability to fish because of declining fish stocks. They became illegal fishermen within the lake and the lagoons. And after that, a lot of them had to quit school. Their kids had to quit school because they could no longer pay for their education. So you have, you're creating, or we're creating this cycle of poverty where on one hand, we're losing livelihoods. On the other hand, we're losing the ability to get an education that would diversify livelihoods for people not to be trapped in this poverty trap at the end of the day. So the solutions part, there's, I hope there is hope, basically. How can technology help? So we know that there are regulations now in place. We know that pol policies are, and advocacy efforts that dr drive policies are increasingly in place. But we also know that even in the most developed countries, we're just not there yet because human resources are, are scarce. Financial resources are scarce. If I give you the example here, I'm going to give you examples from developed countries where in Canada, for example, here in BC, in one of the best managed fisheries in the world, we are only able to monitor 40 fishermen at a time out of 2000 fishermen. And that is not great because on one hand, what we have is that we're going to focus on the ones that have committed an offense before. And on another hand, Enforcement is being accused of harassment because they can they cannot do anything else. That is the only thing that they can do. The command centers of the Canadian Coast Guard, which I visited recently, you have to have your eyes on the screen at all times in order to see what's going on at sea, in order to see where vessels are and what they're doing, and if there's a risk to safety or a risk to an offense of any sort. And the reality is that you cannot even look at your phone, you cannot even take a breather, you have to stay focused on the screen. And the chances of human errors there are quite massive. This this is why we have accidents that see happening because unfortunately as people we can only process a number of pieces of information at a time so the technologies that are out there to help we know that vms has been out there for decades vessel monitoring systems um, automatic identification systems all these trackers on board vessels that are great but unfortunately can also can only track two percent of the current fleet out there there are the command and fusion centers we've talked about sharing intelligence um, we've talked about how, you know, uh, that intelligence coming together is already a solution. And that's already great because and vessels are highly mobile. And if we do not share intelligence, we are going to miss out on analysis of risks or risk um, opportunities, I would say, that are quite important to, to tackle. Uh, we're talking also about blind patrolling. This is how things are often done right now. We have two forms of patrolling initiatives, I would, I would say. One where we have Navy, Coast Guard, Maritime Police, enforcement agencies that go out there that have naval assets, go out there and monitor the waters in the hopes of catching something or in the hopes of deterring because when you're present, people tend not to do that many infractions. But at this particular point in time, the oceans are so vast, we are not able to tackle everything, especially not with blind patrolling. So the idea here is to bring in increased intelligence on the table, not only to inform blind patrolling, but also know or let the offenders know that we're watching. And the new ideas to close the deal that are often brought onto the table are artificial, artificial intelligence uh, initiatives that allow to profile activities out there. Um, we are also looking into risk intelligence on assets, owners, and areas. So sharing information as much as possible through new platforms um, is really important here to understand what vessels are doing and what their owners are doing. And also something that is quite important anywhere in terms of maritime domain awareness technologies is really tracking vessels. And there's a lot of debate here with regards to whether or not small scale vessels should be tracked. But I believe personally that it's important to have people for their safety, to have people have these trackers on board to be able to not only monitor their movements for their own safety, but also to be able to at least manage 
the massive amount, the massive amount of fish stocks that are being um, tackled by the small scale sector and to be able to manage them better for the benefits of the communities and society. Um, one question that I would like to ask eventually is that our country's regulations ready, not only for their fisheries, for their policies, but also for these new technologies. The reality is that we're seeing increasingly new technologies. I myself am part of NCIS, which is Nautical Crime Investigation Services, where we develop profiling and risk assessment technologies for the maritime sector in general. But what we're seeing is that these technologies are not regulated, which means there is a risk of breach, breaches of ethics. We can discriminate against people using these technologies. So the question here remains, are countries ready for these new initiatives that are most needed, that are a necessity right now to tackle the issue of illegal fishing? What we're doing right now at Nautical Crime Investigation Services is we're developing these technologies. So we have, for example, a system that is called HAVA, which is a risk assessment tool that reports on any illegal activities at sea in 23 languages. So it looks basically to intelligence from open source programs over every single nation out there um, in most in the most spoken languages in the world and reports that by building their network ownership or otherwise and reports that information to authorities. The system is going to be available during um, the by the end of this year, but the idea is really to share intelligence um, at different levels of where intelligence is needed. We've also developed EDIS trackers. This is also a new technology that is using swarm satellites. We mentioned, we've mentioned earlier the dumping in space. So it's funny because, um, you know, we need those satellites, but at the same time, we're polluting our somehow um, space with those with those satellites as well so edis trackers have been specially developed for that 98 percent of the fleet that has not been um tracked so far and the idea is to have simple trackers on board vessels with one button which is basically help me button so an sos button for people to be tracked not necessarily for compliance to tackle illegal fishing but also for um, safety at sea I believe in technologies, but I also believe that people have to come together eventually because intelligence and sharing intelligence to tackle the issue of illegal fishing is very important. We have seen in 2015, and I know this is quite, um, it's the first time that this has happened where we had a ma massive case. It was called the Vidal Armadores case or the Bandit Six, where we had many vessels, six vessels that were inv involved in illegal fishing all over the world. And I, India was part of the uh, stakeholders that were trying to tackle the issue. There was New Zealand as well, Malaysia, uh, even Kenya, and uh, finally Senegal and Spain, where the owner of those vessels were, were based, um, was based. The, at the time, the vessels were clearly committing crimes that way beyond just illegal fishing. We're looking into human rights and labor abuse, insurance fraud, money laundering, tax evasion, et cetera. And the reality was that it was really difficult to tackle the issue in Spain because the vessels had multiple flags and Spain did not have any jurisdiction. The way that the problem was solved was really by sharing information. There was Interpol that was involved, all these other countries that were sharing um, intelligence at that particular point in time. And what happened was that because of that shared intelligence, and although the government or the courts in Spain could not prosecute the owners for illegal fishing, they could find enough information to prosecute for something that they had jurisdiction on, which was tax evasion and money laundering. So we clearly see that there is one massive solution there, which is sharing intelligence. Technology is part of it, obviously, but also human willingness to doing so is, is part of the solution. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. That was a, uh, a very, very thorough and a very important and a clear presentation. And uh, it dovetails so well with uh, Vice Admiral Ben Beckering's uh, focus on uh, governance on enforcement, but also his own um, experience, not just as a 40 year um, long leader of the Dutch Navy, but also his work around Somalia in piracy, but also community relations. Um. Thanks for having me here. And um, I have prepared a nice couple of pictures, which I always do when I do a presentation. Uh, but um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll try to inform you how um, I think the IMCCS, which is what I'm part of, and GMA could work together. Now, the International Military Council on Climate Change and Security um, has been an effort by uh, think tanks and researchers and um, uh, diplomats and military to seek ways to influence the debate 
on uh, climate change and security. Um, there was a strong feeling that the climate change debate uh, was almost captured by people on the extremes. So you had those who denied climate change and those who were, who were willing to, to sacrifice everything to prevent climate change. But the debate was caught by those two extremes and already done in the middle. And um, from own experiences, uh, we thought that, that the, the security experts, diplomats, military, etc., could contribute to a wider kaleidoscope in the uh, climate debate. Uh, my own experience was in um, uh, Somalia doing counter piracy operations. And instead of waiting uh, at sea, at the high seas, for the pirates to come out for the ships, um, I thought I was in command at that stage of a NATO task group. I thought it was best to go close inshore and talk to the local people and see if we could uh, gain their support, first their trust and then their support in fighting uh, the pirates. Um, so that's what we did. We did lots of uh, um, what we call key leader engagements with the local population and asking them uh, for their support. They said, yeah, that's that's no problem because piracy to us is a menace as well. But while you're here, could you also help us with preventing our uh, wells to silt? Uh, could you help us preventing um, uh, uh, could you explain to us why uh, the, the, the rain patterns are dra changing dramatically, uh, why the fish is fleeing from the Gulf of Aden into more in less accessible water for our own small fishing boats? Um, because that's what's happening here. And those are the drivers for um, crime, for extremism, but also mostly for migration. Because this part of Somalia, the northern part of Somalia, is becoming less and less habitable. And I gave it thought there, but I was obviously focused with counter piracy. When I got back to the Netherlands discussing what my experiences were of Somalia, uh, my colleagues uh, who had been in Afghanistan came with similar stories that it was things that were not seen locally as climate change because they were very busy with trying to survive their own lives. Um, that, but it was climate change that was, uh, was affecting their life and was a huge contributor to the tensions, the crisis and the conflicts in those regions. So we got together and I must say Tom Middendorp, who was the former chief of defense in the Netherlands, was instrumental in that and trying to bring together a, a group of people that we could link climate change and security. Uh, basically, uh, for two reasons. Uh, we could, at one end, inform the military in how they could prepare themselves better, how they could mitigate and adapt to climate change. But also we felt that if we looked at uh, developing crisis situations and conflict situations, uh, we could predict where uh, climate change was affecting people most. Um, so that's what the when the IMCCS uh, came to life. Um, and I'm, I'm, we're definitely not um, uh, climate change experts, but we're experts in security. But we feel that by bringing to table this security aspect of climate change, um, then uh, we uh, can make a difference. Now, we feel that uh, climate change changes the geostrategic landscape, for instance. Um, you can clearly see that in the Arctic, you can where uh, the global powers, so to say, are already messing together uh, and seek seek ways to uh, in, to create their uh, to improve their influence in the region. But you also see that in the uh, rivers that um, uh, come from the Tibetan plateau, um, most of those rivers most of those rivers go through a number of countries, and they serve the livelihood of a uh, hundred millions of people. Um, uh, the construction of a huge amount of dams on that Tibetan plateau uh, creates potentially uh, disastrous circumstances for those millions of people that live downstream. Um, climate change is also a threat multiplier for uh, fragile states, in particular uh, the Sahel, which we call uh, the canary in the coal mine. And for those who are not familiar, uh, the miners in the old days, and certainly the Dutch mines, coal mines, 
they took a little canary with them in the mines. And if the canary would die, they knew they would have to flee from the mine because then the, there was a lack of oxygen. And we see uh, the Sahel as this canary in the coal mine. Uh, everything that you see happened there, uh, poor governance, the quest for rare earth materials by global powers, uh, rising instability, uh, migration, cr crime, uh, and extremism, it's all happening there in the Sahel. And I think it is a, it, it, it is a, uh, an indicator for many other regions. Um, but in particular, uh, climate change obviously is affecting uh, uh, human security. Um, extreme weather, uh, coastal erosion, uh, changing weather patterns, um, as I mentioned, the monsoon patterns changing, uh, they could well be pivot, pivot points. And to give you an example, in my 40 years in the Navy, we perhaps as a Navy had to go out in full numbers to the Caribbean, to the other parts of the Dutch Kingdom, uh, to help out after a hurricane. And in the last five years, we've been out there five times. So things are happening and it's affecting people's life. Um, so for the military, uh, it is crucial that we reduce footprint. Um, and uh, there are... We, the, 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 the armed forces uh, like to call themselves first responder and last man standing. Uh, but if your own bases are flooded um, or destroyed by extreme weather, how can you still be standing and how can you ever be a first responder? Now, so the, the military must prepare themselves for climate change. And in that respect, uh, they need to work hard on making themselves ready, their training, their doctrine, where are our operations likely to be, uh, our equipment, uh, and, and not just because that um, is uh, a good thing to do and, 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 and creates a better image, but it's, it's, it is also crucial for the military to retain their license to operate and their freedom to maneuver. If you do not... Uh, adapt and mitigate your armed forces to what is happening in the world, um, you will lose support of the public because they are all having to do a lot of work in uh, adaptation and uh, mitigation. So why not the military? And I must say that for a long, long time, the military has always been good to say, well, we can't really change because we're here for national security. Uh, my saying to that is climate change is national security. Um, um, and the second thing is freedom to operate. If you look at the operation in Afghanistan, 70% of the logistic tail uh, that, that uh, uh, was needed to support operations was, uh, um, uh, was used to transport uh, fuel uh, and other uh, fuel to the uh, armed forces. So if you could become independent from fossil fuel, you can vastly reduce the logistics tail. Um, and so those are the two reasons why we feel the military should uh, act. Now, uh, we realized that would not happen automatically. Uh, and therefore in February, 2019, the uh, IMCCS was established. Um, Tom Middendorp, the former Dutch Chot, was instrumental. Uh, and he teamed up with uh, Sherry Goodman, uh, a longstanding diplomat and a civil servant in the United States. Um, and they, they came up with the International Military Council on Climate Change and Security. It consists of the leadership that I've just mentioned with a few people around it. It is a council, a network of, of security specialists, diplomats, military, scientists, and institutional partners um, uh, in France, the United States, um, and uh, the Netherlands. Uh, the uh, site of the IMCCS, uh, www.imccs.org, org, um, clearly indicates who is who and, and who is attached to this. Now, uh, what the IMCCS did is define the context in which we had to operate, climate change impact, uh, impacts habitability uh, and is causing crisis and uh, conflicts uh, and therefore all need to act. Our niche in that discussion is that we are aware of climate change, but we're experts in crisis and conflicts. And our message is climate change causes conflicts, 
uh, and will therefore dictate where, how, and when the military will have to operate. And second, the military needs to mit mitigate and adapt to maintain, as I mentioned, license to operate and freedom to maneuver. Our, op our modus operandi in this is um, how we work, and that's by forming a network and then looking at where can we anticipate uh, the effects of climate change, analysis that, um, and address it, and then uh, present it as the security risks of a changing climate through advocacy. That's basically what we do. And we do this advocacy during summits, in publications, and in meetings. And for instance, um, we've been quite successful in, in shaping the recent um, uh, climate uh, documents from both the NATO and the European Union. Um, so that has helped an awful lot. Now, in, um, in do it, I'll skip that one because I really need that picture for it. So the IMCCS um, is therefore looking at uh, security risks and therefore potential conflicts. But I must say it's mostly on land. Uh, and as you all know, uh, on land, um, the whole lab mouse is divided in nations. Borders are mostly clearly defined. Jurisdiction within those borders is usually clear. And compliance is done. Uh, and if not, uh, you have national enforcement. And there's even international arbitration organized uh, if a crisis erupts between two or more nations. On the oceans, it's a different matter. And I think Admiral Doan made it very clear. Um, uh, uh, the, the oceans uh, contain a large number of uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, where there are borders, there are often disputes. Look at the Mediterranean or the Arctic or the South China Sea. Jurisdiction differs uh, the more, the further you cut away from land. And enforcement is certainly not uh, available in the A, B, and Gs. Um, and this, despite a promising uh, high seas treaty, um, there's little international arbitration. So I must say that where the IMCCS can concentrate on how can we prevent conflict and how can we prepare ourselves better for climate change, I think the oceans will have um, a much tougher um, uh, work ahead of them. Um, so for the GMA, um, um, uh, it is it is timely and it's much needed. Um, but uh, uh, what we should think of also is um, the next step beyond making uh, a plan and an accord, but also how then we how do we then get uh, the world to move and act on this because time is limited. Um, uh, and I think the GMA Academy uh, is a great organization, great setup to stimulate debate and see how we can formulate uh, an accord, come up with a plan, and then make sure that plan is being turned into reality. Uh, and that um, any uh, any part that I can play in that, uh, well, I will be most delighted. Well, thank you very much, Vice Admiral. I uh, was a, uh, a a very inspired speech, and I'm sure it would have been um, weakened by your slides. I remember the f last time I spoke in China, the uh, chair of the conference said, "Professor Drogi, do you have slides or do you have something to say?" But he he meant, "Will you speak freely?" Uh, you spoke really very well. Congratulations. I can see Dia has lots of questions for you particularly around uh, Somalia, but uh, we will have to defer that. Is that all right? We have lots of opportunities to have another session like this on the issue of uh, climate change, the issues of uh, illegal fishing, but also my uh, key interest in the importance of biodiversity and the avoidance of pollution in the oceans as being really key, critical for the climate management. And it's completely underappreciated, not just in the uh, uh, COPs and the uh, Conference of the Parties in the UN FCCC, but also in the in the Ocean Treaty itself. There's hardly mm -hmm. any word about um, fossil fuel emissions and how critical mm -hmm. 
that curtailment is for the survival of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And the missing piece is really the threat to biodiversity that comes from, from pollution and uh, the protection of the biomass biodiversity itself uh, to reducing illegal fishing and, uh, uh, and phasing it out. So the GMA Admiral has uh, come to life and the GMA Academy is rolling. I can see we're rolling closer towards midnight in Delhi and I will make sure that you get to bed in time. But would you like to say some uh, clo closing words, uh, Admiral, um, or Dia, or anyone um, in this illustrious circle before I close the session? Yeah, I, I would like to say, uh, uh, Peter, that uh, actually it is uh, a great start to launch uh, the ship um, uh, or the launch.